Enter a Dragoon by Thomas Hardy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I lately had a melancholy experience, said the gentleman who is answerable for the truth of this story. It was that of going over a doomed house, with whose outside aspect I long had been familiar. A house, that is, which by reason of age and dilapidation was to be pulled down during the following week. Some of the thatch, brown and rotten as the gills of old mushrooms, had indeed been removed before I walked over the building. Seeing that it was only a very small house, which is usually called a cottage residence, situated in a remote hamlet, and that it was not more than a hundred years old, if so much, I was led to think in my progress through the hollow rooms, with their cracked walls and sloping floors, what an exceptional number of abrupt family incidents had taken place therein, to reckon only those which had come to my own knowledge and no doubt there were many more of which I had never heard. It stood at the top of a garden stretching down to the lane or street that ran through a hermit group of dwellings in Melstock Parish. From a green gate at the lower entrance, over which the thorn hedge had been shaped to an arch by constant clippings, a gravel path ascended between the box edges of once trim raspberry, strawberry, and vegetable plots toward the front door. This was in color an ancient and bleached green that could be rubbed off with the finger, and it bore a small, long-featured brass knocker covered with verdigris in its crevices. For some years before this eve of demolition, the homestead had degenerated and been divided into two tenements to serve as cottages for farm laborers, but in its prime it had indisputable claim to be considered neat, pretty, and genteel. The variety of incidents above alluded to was mainly owing to the nature of the tenure, whereby the place had been occupied by families not quite of the kind customary in such spots, people whose circumstances, position, or antecedents were more or less of a critical happy-go-lucky cast. And of these residents, the family whose term comprised the story I wish to relate was that of Mr. Jacob Paddock the market gardener, who dwelt there for some years with his wife and grown-up daughter. 1. An evident commotion was agitating the premises, which jerked busy sounds across the front plot, resembling those of a disturbed hive. If a member of the household appeared at the door, it was with a countenance of abstraction and concern. Evening began to bend over the scene, and the other inhabitants of the hamlet came out to draw water, their common well being in the public road opposite the garden and house of the paddocks. Having wound up their buckets full respectively, they lingered and spoke significantly together. From their words, any casual listener might have gathered information of what had occurred. The woodman who lived nearest the site of the story told most of the tale. Selina, the daughter of the paddocks opposite, had been surprised that afternoon by receiving a letter from her once intended husband, then a corporal, but now a sergeant-major of dragoons, whom she had hitherto supposed to be one of the slain in the Battle of the Alma two or three years before. "'She picked up when against her father's wish, as we know, and before he got his stripes,' their informant continued." not but that the man was as hardy a feller as you'd meet this side of london but jacob you see wished her to do better and one can understand it however she was determined to stick to him at that time and for what happened she was not much to blame so near as they were to matrimony when the war broke out and spoiled all even the very pig had been killed for the wedding said a woman and the barrel of beer ordered in oh the man meant honourable enough but to be off in two days to fight in a foreign country, twas natural of her father to say they should wait till he got back. And he never came back, murmured one in the shade. The war ended, but her man never turned up again. She was not sure he was killed, but was too proud or timid to go and hunt for him. One reason why her father forgave her when he found out how matters stood was, as he said plain at the time, that he liked the man and could see that he meant to act straight so the old folks made the best of what they couldn't mend and kept her there with them when some wouldn't 
time has proved seemingly that he did mean to act straight now that he has writ to her that he's coming she'd have stuck to him all through time tis my belief if t'other hadn't come along at the time of the courtship resumed the woodman the regiment was quartered in casterbridge barracks and he and she got acquainted by his calling to buy a penworth of wrath ripes off that tree yonder in her father's orchard though twas said he seed her over hedge as well as the apples he declared twas kind of apple that he much fancied and he called for a penworth every day till the tree was cleared it ended in his calling for her twas a thousand pities they didn't jine up at once and had done wit well better late than never if so be he'll have her now but lord she'd had that faith in and she'd no more belief than he was alive when i didn't come home than that the undermost man in our churchyard was alive she'd never have thought of another but for that oh no tis awkward altogether for her now still she hadn't married with the new man though to be sure she would have committed it next week even the license being got they say for she'd have no bans this time the first being so unfortunate perhaps the sergeant-major will think he's released and go as he came oh not as i reckon soldiers bain't particular and she's a tidy piece of furniture still what will happen is that she'll have her soldier and won't break off the master wheelwright license or no daze me if she won't in the progress of these desultory conjectures the form of another neighbour arose in the gloom she nodded to the people at the well who replied good night mrs stone as she passed through mr paddock's gate towards his door she was an intimate friend of the latter's household and the group followed her with their eyes up the path and past the windows which were now lighted up by candles inside Two mrs stone paused at the door knocked and was admitted by selina's mother who took her visitor at once into the parlour on the left hand where a table was partly spread for supper on the buffet against the wall stood probably the only object which would have attracted the eye of a local stranger in an otherwise ordinarily furnished room a great plum cake guarded as if it were a curiosity by a glass shade of the kind seen in museums square with a wooden back like those enclosing stuffed specimens of rare feather or fur this was the mummy of the cake intended in earlier days for the wedding feast of selina and the soldier which had been religiously and lovingly preserved by the former as a testimony to her intentional respectability in spite of an untoward subsequent circumstance which will be mentioned this relic was now as dry as a brick and seemed to belong to a pre-existent civilization till quite recently selina had been in the habit of pausing before it daily and recalling the accident whose consequences had thrown a shadow over her life ever since that of which the water-drawers had spoken the sudden news one morning that the rout had come for the unth dragoons two days only being the interval before departure the hurried consultation as to what should be done the second time of asking being passed but not the third and the decision that it would be unwise to solemnize matrimony in such haphazard circumstances even if it were possible which was doubtful before the fire the young woman in question was now seated on a low stool in the stillness of reverie and a toddling boy played about the floor around her ah mrs stone said selina rising slowly how kind of you to come in you'll bide to supper mother has told you the strange news of course no but i heard it outside that is that you'd had a letter from mr clark sergeant major clark as they say he is now and that he's coming to make it up with thee yes coming to-night all the way from the north of england where he's quartered i don't know whether i'm happy or frightened at it of course i always believed that if he was alive he'd come and keep his solemn vow to me but when it is printed that a man is killed what can you think it was printed why yes after the battle of the alma the book of the names of the killed and wounded was nailed up against casterbridge town hall door twas on a saturday and i walked there a purpose to read and see for myself for i'd heard that his name was down there was a crowd of people round the book looking for the names of relations and i can mind that when they saw me they made way for me knowing that we'd been just going to be married and that as you say i belonged to him well i reached up my arm and turned over the ferrules of the book and under the killed i read his surname but instead of john they'd printed james 
and I thought twas a mistake, and that it must be he. Who could have guessed that there were two nearly of one name in one regiment? Well, he's coming to finish the wedding of ee, as may be said, so never mind, my dear. All's well that ends well. That's what he seems to say, but then he has not yet heard about Mr. Miller, and that's what rather terrifies me. Luckily, my marriage with him next week was to have been by license and not bans, as in John's case, and it was not so well known on that account. Still, I don't know what to think. Everything seems to come just twixt cap and lip with thee, don't it now, Miss Paddock? Two weddings broke off. Tis odd. How came you to accept Mr. Miller, my dear? He's been so good and faithful, not minding about the child at all, for he knew the rights of the story. He's dearly fond of Johnny, you know, just as if twere his own, isn't he, my duck? Do Mr. Miller love you, or don't he? Yes, and I love Mr. Miller, said the toddler. Well, you see, Mrs. Stone, he said he'd make me a comfortable home, and thinking twould be a good thing for Johnny, Mr. Miller being so much better off than me, I agreed at last, just as a widow might, which is what I have always felt myself, ever since I saw what I thought was John's name printed there. I hope John will forgive me. So he will forgive ye, since twas no matter of wrong to him. He ought to have sent ye a line saying twas another man. Selina's mother entered. "'We've not known of this an hour, Mrs. Stone,' she said. "'The letter was brought up from Lower Millstock post-office by one of the school-children only this afternoon. Mr. Miller was coming here this very night to settle about the wedding doings. Hark! Is that your father, or is it Mr. Miller already come?' The footsteps entered the porch. There was a brushing on the mat, and the door of the room sprung back to disclose a rubicund man about thirty years of age, of thriving master mechanic appearance and obviously comfortable temper. On seeing the child, and before taking any notice whatever of the elders, the comer made a noise like the crowing of a cock and flapped his arms as if they were wings, a method of entry which had the unqualified admiration of Johnny. "'Yes, it is he,' said Selina, constrainedly advancing." what were you all talking about me my dear said the genial young man when he had finished his crowing and resumed human manners why what's the matter he went on you look struck all of a heap mr miller spread an aspect of concern over his own face and drew a chair up to the fire oh mother would you tell mr miller if he don't know mr miller and going to be married in six days he interposed ah he don't know it yet murmured mrs paddock know what well john clark now that sergeant major clark wasn't shot at alma after all twas another of the most same name now that's interesting there are several cases like that and he's home again and he's coming here to-night to see her whatever shall i say that he may not be offended with what i've done interposed selina but why should it matter if he be oh i must agree to be his wife if he forgives me of course i must must but why not say nay selina even if he do forgive ye oh no how can i without being wicked you were very kind mr miller to ask me to have you no other man would have done it after what had happened and i agreed even though i did not feel half so warm as i ought yet it was entirely owing to my believing him in the grave as i knew that if he were not he would carry out his promise and this shows that i was right in trusting him yes he must be a goodish sort of fellow said mr miller for a moment so impressed with the excellently faithful conduct of the sergeant-major of dragoons that he disregarded its effect upon his own position he sighed slowly and added well selina tis for you to say i love you and i love the boy and there's my chimney corner and sticks of furniture ready for ye both yes i know but i mustn't hear it any more now murmured selina quickly john will be here soon I hope he'll see how it all was when I tell him. If so be I could have written it to him, it would have been better. You think he doesn't know a single word about our having been on the brink of it? But perhaps it's the other way. He's heard of it, and that may have brought him. Ah, oh, perhaps he has, she said, brightening, and already forgives me. If not, speak out straight and fair, and tell him exactly how it fell out. If he's a man, he'll see it. Oh, he's a man, true enough but i really do think i shan't have to tell him at all since you put it to me that way as it was now johnny's bedtime he was carried upstairs and when selina came down again her mother observed with some anxiety i fancy mr clark must be here soon if he's coming and that being so perhaps mr miller wouldn't mind wishing us good night since you are so determined to stick to your sergeant-major 
a little bitterness bubbled amid the closing words it would be less awkward mr miller not being here if he will allow me to say it to be sure to be sure the master wheelwright exclaimed with instant conviction rising alertly from his chair lord bless my soul he said taking up his hat and stick and we to have been married in six days but selina you're right you do belong to the child's father since he's alive i'll try to make the best of it before the generous miller had got further there came a knock to the door accompanied by the noise of wheels i thought i heard something driving up said mrs paddock they heard mr paddock who had been smoking in the room opposite rise and go to the door and in a moment a voice familiar enough to selina was audibly saying at last i am here again not without many interruptions how is it with thee mr paddock and how is she thought never to see me again i suppose a step with a clink of spurs in it struck upon the entry floor danged if i bain't catched murmured mr miller forgetting company speech never mind i may as well meet him here as elsewhere and i should like to see the chap and make friends with him as he seems one of the right sort he returned to the fireplace just as the sergeant major was ushered in three he was a good specimen of the long service soldier of those days a not unhandsome man with a certain undemonstrative dignity which some might have said to be partly owing to the stiffness of his uniform about his neck the high stock still being worn he was much stouter than when selina had parted with him although she had not meant to be demonstrative she ran across to him directly she saw him and he held her in his arms and kissed her then in much agitation she whispered something to him at which he seemed to be much surprised he's just put to bed she continued you can go up and see him i knew you'd come home if you were alive but i had quite gid you up for dead you've been home in england ever since the war ended yes dear why didn't you come sooner that's just what i ask myself why was i such a sappy as not to hurry here the first day i set foot on shore well who'd have thought it you are as pretty as ever he relinquished her to peep upstairs a little way where by looking through the balusters he could see johnny's cot just within an open door on his stepping down again mr miller was preparing to depart now what's this i'm sorry to see anybody going the moment i've come expostulated the sergeant major i thought we might make an evening of it there's a nine gallon cask of phoenix beer outside in the trap and a ham and half a raw mill cheese for i thought you might be sure to forage in a lonely place like this and it struck me we might like to ask a neighbor or two but perhaps it would be taking a liberty oh no not at all said mr paddock who was now in the room in a judicial measured manner very thoughtful of ye only twas not necessary for we had just laid in an extra stock of eatables and drinkables in preparation for the coming event twas very kind upon my heart said the soldier to think me worth such a jocund preparation since you could only have got my letter this morning selina gazed at her father to stop him and exchanged embarrassed glances with miller contrary to her hopes sergeant major clark plainly did not know that the preparations referred to were for something quite other than his own visit the movement of the horse outside and the impatient tapping of a whip-handle upon the vehicle reminded them that clark's driver was still in waiting the provisions were brought into the house and the cart dismissed miller with very little pressure indeed accepted an invitation to supper and a few neighbors were induced to come in to make up a cheerful party during the laying of the meal and throughout its continuance selina who sat beside her first intended husband tried frequently to break the news to him of her engagement to the other now terminated so suddenly and so happily for her heart and her sense of womanly virtue but the talk ran entirely upon the late war and though fortified by half a horn of the strong ale brought by the sergeant-major she decided that she might have a better opportunity when supper was over of revealing the situation to him in private having supped clark leaned back at ease in his chair and looked around we used some time to have a dance in that other room after supper selina dear i recollect we used to clear out all the furniture into this room before beginning have you kept up such goings-on no not at all said his sweetheart sadly we were not unlikely to revive it in a few days said mr paddock but howsomever there's seemingly many a slip as the saying is yes i'll tell john all about that by and by interposed selina at which perceiving that the secret which he did not like keeping was to be kept even yet her father held his tongue with some show of testiness the subject of a dance having been broached to put the thought in practice was the feeling of all 
soon after the tables and chairs were borne from the opposite room to this by zealous hands and two of the villagers sent home for a fiddle and tambourine when the majority began to tread a measure well known in that secluded vale selina naturally danced with the sergeant-major not altogether to her father's satisfaction and to the real uneasiness of her mother both of whom would have preferred a postponement of festivities till the rashly anticipated relationship between their daughter and clark in the past had been made fact by the church's ordinances they did not however express a positive objection mr paddock remembering with self-reproach that it was owing to his original strongly expressed disapproval of selina's being a soldier's wife that the wedding had been delayed and finally hindered with worse consequences than were expected and ever since the misadventure brought about by his government he had allowed events to steer their own courses my tails will surely catch on your spurs john murmured the daughter of the house as she whirled around upon his arm with the rapt soul and look of a somnambulist i didn't know we should dance or i would have put on my other frock i'll take care my love we've danced here before do you think your father objects to me now i've risen in rank i fancy he's still a little against me he has repented times enough and so have i if i had married you then twould have saved many a misfortune i have sometimes thought it might have been possible to rush the ceremony through somehow before i left though we were only in the second asking were we and even if i had come back straight here when we returned from the crimea and married you then how much happier i should have been dear john to say that why didn't you oh dilatoriness and want of thought and a fear of facing your father after so long i was in the hospital a great while you know but how familiar the place seems again what's that i saw on the buffet in the other room it never used to be there a sort of withered corpse of a cake not an old bride cake surely yes john ours tis the very one that was made for our wedding three years ago sakes alive why time shuts up together and all between then and now seems not to have been what became of that wedding gown that they were making in this room i remember a bluish whitish frothy thing i have that too really why selina yes why not put it on now wouldn't it seem a and yet oh how i should like to it would remind them all if we told them what it was how we really meant to be married on that bygone day her eyes were again laden with wet yes the pity that we didn't the pity moody mournfulness seemed to hold silent a while one not naturally taciturn well will you he said i will the next dance if mother don't mind accordingly just before the next figure was formed selina disappeared and speedily came downstairs in a creased and box-worn but still airy and pretty muslin gown which was indeed the very one that had been meant to grace her as a bride three years before it is dreadfully old-fashioned she apologized not at all what a grand thought of mine now let's to it again she explained to some of them as he led her to the second dance what the frock had been meant for and that she had put it on at his request and again athwart and around the room they went you seem the bride he said but i couldn't wear this gown to be married in now she replied ecstatically or i shouldn't have put it on and made it dusty it is really too old-fashioned and so folded and fretted out you can't think that was with my taking it out so many times to look at i have never put it on never till now selina i am thinking of giving up the army will you emigrate with me to new zealand i've an uncle out there doing well and he'd soon help me to making a larger income the english army is glorious but it ain't altogether enriching of course anywhere that you decide upon is it healthy there for johnny a lovely climate and i shall never be happy in england aha he concluded again with a bitterness of unexpected strength would to heaven i had come straight back here as the dance brought around one neighbor after another the reunited pair were thrown into juxtaposition with brob hertal among the rest who had been called in one whose chronic expression was that he carried inside him a joke on the point of bursting with its own vastness he took occasion now to let out a little of its quality shaking his head at selina as he addressed her in an undertone this is a bit of a topper to the bridegroom ho ho twill teach in the liberty you'll expect when you've married in what does he mean by a topper the sergeant-major asked who not being of local extraction despised the venerable local language and also seemed to suppose bridegroom to be an anticipatory name for himself 
I only hope I shall never be worse treated than you've treated me to-night. Selina looked frightened. He didn't mean you, dear, she said as they moved on. We thought perhaps you knew what had happened owing to your coming just at this time. Had you heard anything about what I intended? Not a breath. How should I, away up in Yorkshire? It was by the merest accident that I came just at this date to make peace with you for my delay. I was engaged to be married to Mr. Bartholomew Miller. That's what it is. I would have let you know by letter, but there was no time, only hearing from you this afternoon. You won't desert me for it, will you, John? Because, as you know, I quite supposed you dead, and, and... Her eyes were full of tears of trepidation, and he might have felt a sob heaving within her. 4. The soldier was silent during two or three double bars of the tune. "'When were you to have been married to the said Mr. Bartholomew Miller?' he inquired. "'Quite soon.' "'How soon?' "'Next week. Oh, yes, just the same as it was with you and me. There's a strange fate of interruption hanging over me, I sometimes think.' He had bought the license which I preferred so that it mightn't be like ours, but it made no difference to the fate of it. He bought the license? The devil! Don't be angry, dear John. I didn't know. No, no, I'm not angry. It was so kind of him, considering. Yes, I see, of course, how natural your action was, never thinking of seeing me any more. Is it the Mr. Miller who is in this dance? Yes. Clark glanced around upon Bartholomew and was silent again for some little while, and she stole a look at him to find that he seemed changed. "'John, you look ill,' she almost sobbed. "'Tisn't me, is it?' "'Oh, dear, no, though I hadn't somehow expected it. I can't find fault with you for a moment, and I don't. This is a deuce of a long dance, don't you think? We've been at it twenty minutes of a second, and the figure doesn't allow one much rest. I'm quite out of breath.' They seem so dreadfully long here. Shall we drop out, or I'll stop the fiddler? Oh, no, no, I think I can finish. But although I look healthy enough, I have never been so strong as I formerly was since that long illness I had in the hospital at Scutari. And I knew nothing about it. You couldn't, dear, as I didn't write. What a fool I have been altogether. He gave a twitch as of one in pain. I won't dance again when this one is over. The fact is, I have travelled a long way to-day, and it seems to have knocked me up a bit. There could be no doubt that the sergeant-major was unwell, and Selina made herself miserable by still believing that her story was the cause of his ailment. Suddenly he said in a changed voice, and she perceived that he was paler than ever, "'I must sit down.' Letting go her waist, he went quickly to the other room. She followed and found him in the nearest chair, his face bent down upon his hands and arms which were resting on the table. "'What's the matter?' said her father, who sat there dozing by the fire. "'John isn't well.' "'We are going to New Zealand when we are married, father. "'A lovely country. "'John, would you like something to drink?' "'A drop of that shitem of old Owlets. "'That's under the stairs, perhaps,' suggested her father. "'Not that nowadays tis much better than licensed liquor.' "'John,' she said, putting her face close to his and pressing his arm, "'will you have a drop of spirits or something?' "'He did not reply, and Selina observed that his ear and the side of his face were quite white.' Convinced that his illness was serious, a growing dismay seized hold of her. The dance ended. Her mother came in, and, learning what had happened, looked narrowly at the sergeant-major. "'We must not let him lie like that. Lift him up,' she said. "'Let him rest in the window-bench on some cushions.' They unfolded his arms and hands as they lay clasped upon the table, and on lifting his head found his features to bear the very impress of death itself. Bartholomew Miller, who had now come in, assisted Mr. Paddock to make a comfortable couch on the window-seat, where they stretched out Clark upon his back. Still he seemed unconscious. "'We must get a doctor,' said Selina. "'Oh, my dear John, how is it you be taken like this?' "'My impression is that he's dead,' murmured Mr. Paddock. "'He don't breathe enough to move a tom-tit's feather.' There were plenty to volunteer to go for a doctor, but as it would be at least an hour before he could get there, the case seemed somewhat hopeless. The dancing party ended as unceremoniously as it had begun, but the guests lingered round the premises till the doctor should arrive. When he did come, the sergeant-major's extremities were already cold, and there was no doubt that death had overtaken him almost at the moment that he had sat down. The medical practitioner quite refused to accept the unhappy Selina's theory that her revelation had in any way induced Clark's sudden collapse. Both he and the coroner afterwards, who found the immediate cause to be heart failure, 
held that such a supposition was unwarranted by facts they asserted that a long day's journey a hurried drive and that an exhausting dance were sufficient for such a result upon a heart enfeebled by fatty degeneration after the privations of a crimean winter and other trying experiences the coincidence of the sad event with any disclosure of hers being a pure accident this conclusion however did not dislodge selina's opinion that the shock of her statement had been the immediate stroke which had felled the constitution so undermined five at this date the casterbridge barracks were cavalry quarters their adaptation to artillery having been effected some years later it had been owing to the fact that the nth dragoons in which john clark had served happened to be lying there that selina made his acquaintance at the time of his death the barracks were occupied by the scots greys but when the pathetic circumstances of the sergeant major's end became known in the town the officers of the greys offered the services of their fine reed and brass band that he might have a funeral marked by due military honours his body was accordingly removed to the barracks and carried thence to the churchyard in the durnover quarter on the following afternoon one of the greys most ancient and docile chargers being blacked up to represent clark's horse on the occasion everybody pitied selina whose story was well known she followed the corpse as the only mourner clark having been without relations in this part of the country and a communication with his regiment having brought none from a distance she sat in a little shabby brown-black mourning carriage, squeezing herself up in a corner to be as much as possible out of sight during the slow and dramatic march through the town to the tune from Saul. When the internment had taken place, the volleys been fired, and the return journey begun, it was with something like a shock that she found the military escort to be moving at a quick march to the lively strains of Off She Goes, as if all care for the sergeant-major was expected to be ended with the late discharge of the carbines. It was, by chance, the very tune to which they had been footing when he died, and unable to bear its notes, she hastily told her driver to drop behind. The band and military party diminished up the high street, and Selina turned over Swan Bridge and homeward to Melstock then recommenced for her a life whose incidents were precisely of a suit with those which had preceded the soldier's return but how different in her appreciation of them her narrow miss of the recovered respectability they had hoped for from that tardy event worked upon her parents as an irritant and after the first week or two of her mourning her life with them grew almost insupportable she had impulsively taken to herself the weeds of a widow for such she seemed to herself to be and clothed little johnny in sables likewise this assumption of a moral relationship to the deceased which she asserted to be only not a legal one by two most unexpected accidents led the old people to indulge in sarcasm at her expense whenever they beheld her attire though all the while it cost them more pain to utter than it gave her to hear it having become accustomed by her residence at home to the business carried on by her father she surprised them one day by going off with the child to chalk newton in the direction of the town of ivell and opening a miniature fruit and vegetable shop attending ivell market with her produce her business grew somewhat larger and it was soon sufficient to enable her to support herself and the boy in comfort she called herself mrs john clark from the day of leaving home and painted the name on her signboard no man forbidding her by degrees the pain of her state was forgotten in her new circumstances and getting to be generally accepted as the widow of a sergeant major of dragoons an assumption which her modest and mournful demeanour seemed to substantiate her life became a placid one her mind being nourished by the melancholy luxury of dreaming what might have been her future in new zealand with john if he had only lived to take her there her only travels now were a journey to ivell on market days and once a fortnight to the churchyard in which clark lay there to tend with johnny's assistance as widows are wont to do the flowers she had planted on his grave on a day about eighteen months after his unexpected decease selina was surprised in her lodging over her little shop by a visit from bartholomew miller he had called on her once or twice before on which occasions he had used without a word of comment the name by which she was known i've come this time he said less because i was in this direction than to ask you mrs clark what you mid well guess i've come on purpose in short she smiled 
tis to ask me again to marry you yes of course you see his coming back for he proved what i always believed to be though others don't there's nobody but would be glad to welcome you to our parish again now you've showed your independence and acted up to your trust in his promise well my dear will you come i'd rather bide as mrs clark i think she answered i am not ashamed of my position at all for i am john's widow in the eyes of heaven i quite agree that's why i've come still you won't like to be always straining at this shopkeeping and market standing and twould be better for johnny if you had nothing to do but tend him he here touched the only weak spot in selina's resistance to his proposal the good of the boy to promote that there were other men she might have married off-hand without loving them if they had asked her to but though she had known the worthy speaker from her youth she could not for the moment fancy herself happy as mrs miller he paused a while i ought to tell ye mrs clark he said by and by that marrying is getting to be a pressing question with me not on my own account at all the truth is that mother is growing old and i am away from home a good deal so that it is almost necessary there should be another person in the house with her besides me that's the practical consideration which forces me to think of taking a wife apart from my wish to take you and you know there's nobody in the world i care for so much she said something about there being far better women than she and other natural commonplaces but assured him she was most grateful to him for feeling what he felt as indeed she sincerely was however selina would not consent to be the useful third person in his comfortable home at any rate just then he went away after taking tea with her without discerning much hope for him in her good-bye six after that evening she saw and heard nothing of him for a great while her fortnightly journeys to the sergeant major's grave were continued whenever weather did not hinder them and mr miller must have known she thought of this custom of hers but though the churchyard was not nearly so far from his homestead as was her shop at chalk newton he never appeared in the accidental way that lovers use an explanation was forthcoming in the shape of a letter from her mother who casually mentioned that mr bartholomew miller had gone away to the other side of shottsford forum to be married to a thriving dairyman's daughter that he knew there his chief motive it was reported had been less one of love than a wish to provide a companion for his aged mother selina was practical enough to know that she had lost a good and possibly the only opportunity of settling in life after what had happened and for a moment she regretted her independence but she became calm on reflection and to fortify herself and her course started that afternoon to tend the sergeant major's grave in which she took the same sober pleasure as at first on reaching the churchyard and turning the corner toward the spot as usual she was surprised to perceive another woman also apparently a respectable widow and with a tiny boy by her side bending over clark's turf and spudding up with the point of her umbrella some ivy roots that selina had reverently planted there to form an evergreen mantle over the mound what are you digging up my ivy for cried selina rushing forward so excitedly that johnny tumbled over a grave with the force of the tug she gave his hand with her sudden start your ivy said the respectable woman why yes i planted it there on my husband's grave your husband's yes the late sergeant major clark anyhow as good as my husband for he was just going to be indeed but who may be my husband if not he i am the only mrs john clark widow of the late sergeant major of dragoons and this is his only son and heir how can that be faltered selina her throat seeming to stick together as she just began to perceive its possibility he had been going to marry me twice and we were going to new zealand ah i remember about you returned the legitimate widow calmly and not unkindly you must be selina he spoke of you now and then and said that his relations with you would always be a weight on his conscience well the history of my life with him is soon told when he came back from crimea he became acquainted with me at my home in the north and we were married within a month of first knowing each other unfortunately after living together a few months we could not agree and after a particularly sharp quarrel in which perhaps i was most in the wrong as i don't mind owning here by his graveside he went away from me declaring that he would buy his discharge and emigrate to new zealand and never come back to me any more the next thing i heard was that he had died suddenly at melstock in some low carouse and as he had left me in such anger to live no more with me i wouldn't come down to his funeral or do anything in relation to him twas temper i know but that was the fact 
even if we had parted as friends it would have been a serious expense to travel three hundred miles to get here for one who wasn't left so very well off i am sorry i pulled up your ivy roots but that common sort of ivy is considered a weed in my part of the country End of Enter a Dragoon by Thomas Hardy Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com